This is Radio Equal Shock with your host, Alex Smith. How did cold Alaska become the hot, smoky place? That was summer 2019 with record shattering heat, a pocket of drought, and smoke that choked out Anchorage and Fairbanks. Is a new climate emerging in the far north? Brian Brett Schneider is a climatologist and researcher at the International Arctic Research Center, University of Alaska Fairbanks. You will find Brian's quotes in Forbes or CNN. He just lived through all that wildfire smoke. Brian, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Hi, how are you doing today, Alex? Pretty good. So I want to ask you the classic question, how was your summer? Well, this was the uh, the summer of warm and and choking on wildfire smoke in Alaska. Well, in, in Anchorage in particular, Alaska was, was warm everywhere, but the the core of that heat was centered in the uh, in the southern part of the state, and of course the uh, epicenter of the smoky conditions was also focused on uh, the southern portion of the state as well. Was it Fairbanks that actually smashed a record that they'd never seen before, as far as temperature goes? You know, it was Anchorage, uh, where I'm located, had the by far the warmest. Well, we had the warmest June on record. We had the warmest July on record. And then we just finished with the warmest August on record. <laughs> and, and any number of daily records just obliterated previous uh, high temperature marks. Uh, particularly, we hit uh, 90 degrees uh, on July 4th. I believe that's 32C. And that was several degrees warmer than any uh, observed temperature ever, you know, in basically in 100 years of record keeping. And not only was it just a one day, we had... A, a, a just a remarkably warm about a, a two week period where we we had I think seven of our ten warmest days on record in a two week period and then it kind of eased off a little bit but then it it warmed back up in August and so we actually ended up with uh, record all time records uh, in August and uh, for dailies but also for con- consecutive days in a row uh, and seasonal totals so by by every single metric it was the warmest summer on record. Not only that, it was the driest summer on record. In fact, if you take our summer precipitation, and if you were to double it, it would still be the driest on record. And so that was a major contributor to the wildfires we saw this summer. These are remarkable changes you're talking about. I live in British Columbia, just south of Alaska. And in the previous two years, summer became a a threatening season. Uh, We had an evacuation kit near the door for a couple of weeks. We couldn't breathe outside. We had to stay in the house with the windows shut in hot weather. Does that sound familiar? In many ways, it does. Here in Anchorage, the the smoke was was thick at times, and it was persistent, and it was unhealthy air. The fire that contributed most of the smoke is about 75 to 80 kilometers to the south. And for those people that live closer to the fire, it was a much more severe hazard as far as people with respiratory conditions, uh, safety as well. You know, for uh, they had to close the only highway that that uh, accesses that part of the state uh, many, many times. You know, it, it was a, it was it was more than just an inconvenience. It, it affected many people's lives, uh, and, and a number of people actually lost their homes. Businesses were burned down. Uh, in, in, in some locations. So it was, a very, it was a very difficult situation. What was it about this summer that made Alaska ripe for massive forest fires? Our wildfire season is very compact uh, compared to other locations farther south. We, we have about a two-month fire season. It kicks in almost reliably the, the 1st of June, and it typically fades away like clockwork at the end of July. And what happened this year was we had a a number of days with thunderstorms early in the season, so in uh, the first week of June, and those started many, many fires. But what what really made the situation quite severe was the incredible drought that then set up and took hold of basically the entire state for the next two months. And so fire starting our normal process, but the occasional rain, particularly starting in July, that, that reliably sets in, just didn't happen this year. And so the fires, there was nothing to, to slow the fires down. And then the incredible warmth that we had uh, worked to, to dry out uh, the vegetation, which made it even more flammable. And it was very sunny 
uh, and light winds, and so that sun helped dry out the vegetation even more. Um, so we really everything kind of came together to make the, the fire season really exceptional. And, and then to top it all off, like clockwork, normally our rainy season kicks in the 1st of August and it puts out the fires. It didn't happen this year in the southern part of the state. Uh, here in Anchorage, we normally average measurable rain on half of all days. Well, we just didn't get any rain at all. I mean, we had just a few millimeters like the last day of the month. And so it was, uh, it, it extended the fire season much, much later than is, is typical. So that really compounded the, uh, the crisis in the fire this year. What would create those conditions? I mean, was the jet stream different? Was there some sort of blocking pattern? I mean, this sounds like a big change for the state. So what I like to tell people is it's a combination of factors. The first factor is we've had a long-term warming. And so, you know, the, that, that's our, that's our climate-based state is warmer than it used to be. And so that's kind of like the background noise that, it, that everything sits on top of. You throw on that record warm ocean waters surrounding the state, okay, and so now that's going to be liberating a lot of heat from that water into the nearby atmosphere, and so that, that kind of warms the, uh, the area around us. It's like, you know, imagine a, uh, uh, in a bathroom, you, you fill up a, a bathtub full of hot water, and you let it sit for a couple hours. Well, what happens to that, that bath water? It gets close to room temperature, but where did that heat go? Well, that heat escaped into the, into the, the air in the bathroom, so it warmed up the air. Well, it's kind of the same effect here. And then on top of that, we had a very unusual set of weather patterns. We had high pressure that just sat over the same area relentlessly the entire summer. So if you look at the upper levels of the atmosphere, uh, we had the re record you know, highest pressures for June. And then in July, we had record highest pressures. And then in August, we had record highest pressure. So it was an, an unusual weather pattern, but it was the persistence that was really, really remarkable. You know, these things normally... They're transients. They come and they go, but they have it almost unmoved for, for months. It's really just astounding. So in 2016, you co-authored a paper titled An Assessment of the Role of Anthropogenic Climate Change in the Alaska Fire Season of 2015. What was special about 2015? Well, 2015 was a, was a big fire year. You know, we had you know, over 4 million acres burn. And that was one of our biggest fire years on record. And, you know, a lot of the, the, the questions that get proposed when we have a big fire year, and 2019 is another big fire year. It wasn't quite as big as 2015. But one of the, one of the things that, that we, we ask ourselves is, well, is this, is this our future? Is this a condition that we're going to be experiencing more frequently as the climate warms? And so it's important to, 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 to step back and they say, you know, is this, uh, what are the contributions of uh, our long-term warming climate to these increases in the fire seasons? And what we found was that we expect that in a warming world, we expect in, in the boreal forests of the north, particularly in Alaska, for there to be more fires and therefore to be more acreage, square miles, square kilometers burned uh, in that warming world. And so when we model this and we say, okay, we're going to have, in a warming world, we're going to have more fires and more fire acreage. Oh, and by the way, um, humans are largely responsible for the warming world. Then we can, now we can, we can make some attributions and say, you know, we are uh, responsible for the, uh, the increase in the fire acreage to some degree. You know, how much of that degree is, uh, we're still working on that in the models. But we can say that our, our contribution to warming the world is also contributing to increasing the amount of fires and fire acreage here in Alaska. It's an interesting problem because climate models predict increased precipitation in the subarctic and the Arctic during this century, and that happens at the same time that the Arctic is warming more than the rest of the world, really. So will wetter forests decrease forest fire activity, or will the extra heat overcome that? How does that work out? Well, that's a great question. And so uh, you're absolutely correct. We expect there to be more precipitation in a warming world. I mean, generally everywhere, but certainly in the Arctic, high latitude areas. Um, and so there's this paradox. You say, well, if it's going to be wetter, well, isn't that going to mean it's going to be harder for fires to start and we would get less fire acreage? And what we found is that the increase in temperature and the increase in atmospheric moisture 
will lead to increases in instability that will make thunderstorms much more common. So we're going to have uh, potentially, you know, 50% more uh, thunderstorm activity. And what we found is that increase in thunderstorm activity will overwhelm the increase in precipitation. And so the warming temperatures will work to cause vegetation to become more biomass, so there'll be more uh, stuff to burn, basically. And when it doesn't rain, it'll be warmer, which will dry out the vegetation even more between the rainfall events. So what we'll see is uh, conditions like this summer will become more common, where we have, we may end up this year with more precipitation than normal, but in between those precipitation events, a lot of dryness, a lot of warmth, and then consequently, when we do get thunderstorms, a lot of fire activity. Yeah, you mentioned the lightning, and I, I think you said that around 2013 or one of those years, there was a time when there were extreme fire conditions. Everything was ready to burn, but it wasn't a bad fire year because you just didn't get the lightning to spark it off. Yeah, you know, you need you need a, a certain set of ingredients for a fire, and, you know, in Alaska, about 95%, and it varies year to year, but on balance, about 95% of the fire acreage is a result of lightning, uh, lightning-started fires. And so if, you're, if you don't have those light, that lightning that, uh, to start the fires, then you're just not going to get it, uh, th- that acreage. Also, it's, it's important to remember that fire acreage, fire activity is highly variable year to year. So we've had some very, very low fire years in the last decade. We've also had some very, very big ones. And so we have to be careful that when we look at a time series, you know, we we have to look at these things over long time periods. We have to look at aggregations of years. So, for example, if next year, we may not have many fires next year. And so would we say, oh, well, maybe they were wrong. Maybe we won't have more fire activity in a warming world. But, you, again, you need to step back and you need to look at all the, the atmospheric parameters and are they coming together for thunderstorms. And so because we have, when you deal statistically with uh, small numbers, when I say small numbers, I mean the number of thunderstorms. So in an entire season, for example, Alaska may have as many lightning strikes as you might have in one day in a bad thunderstorm complex around Oklahoma City. I think a, a few days ago they had almost a million lightning strikes around Oklahoma City, you know, in in a 24-hour period. Well, that's more than we had the entire year. So you can have a a couple of uh, lightning thunderstorm outbreaks that start a lot of fires in Alaska, or those may not come together in in a particular year, and you might not have many fires. And that's what happened in 2013, in 2008, and a couple other years in the last decade. But on balance, those number of thunderstorms is going up, the number of lightning strikes is going up, and the number of fires and fire acreage is going up. Well, we know the warming is happening across the Arctic and across the Northern Hemisphere, but I wonder, did the same weather system help Siberia to experience the major wildfires that it had in this same summer as Alaska did? I'm not um, familiar with the amount of lightning activity they had in Siberia, but they certainly had conditions, atmospheric conditions, that once fires were started— uh, helped promote fire growth and, and, and extreme fire behavior. And so climatologically, they have many of the same uh, settings as we have here in Alaska uh, and in other parts of the world, the, the northern boreal forest. And, you know, w- once you get those lightning strikes to spark it, there's really no stopping it once you have the warm conditions and the dryness. You, you need the rainfall uh, to come and stop it. And the, during the time of our our high sun season, so June and particularly the first part of July, we saw the same thing here as they saw in Siberia. And that was, you know, once these fires get going, they are uh, relentless in the acreage that they burn. And the dry conditions that we saw here were also evident in, uh, particularly in Western Siberia. You just, you can't put the fires out. Well, I know in northern Canada, like in the Yukon and uh, further east from that, we don't even try to put the fires out. It's impossible to get the human power in to do it. So when they start, they burn. That's the same. Uh, that's the same thing here in Alaska, and presumably it's the same in Siberia. You know, we're talking about remote areas that are very difficult to get into. There's no, you know, there's no highways. There's no infrastructure to get people in there. 
and the uh, what what small populations are there are generally along rivers and can be evacuated if necessary. But uh, it's, there's just not the uh, the infrastructure to fight fires, and there's not the there's not the the need in many cases because there's it's just wide open forest for the most part. So the the management strategy in Alaska is primarily to let them the fires burn unless they are uh, threatening people or or structures or uh, well, we have native allotments. So you know once the fires go, they they basically just burn. And you see that with the if you look at the statistics on the number of fires, and I, I mentioned lightning accounts for the overwhelming vast majority of acreage burned. Well, we, if you actually look at the, the raw number of fires, it's about even with human starts and lightning starts. But the human start fires are, are generally, you know, they're in the cities or they're right along what highways we do have. And so they, they contribute very little to the overall acreage because they're uh, able to be put out usually in, in, in very quick time. So, you know, fires are good for, for the ecology of a region. And so there are, there are benefits to the fires. Uh, but as, as the acreage increases over time, we have other considerations that we didn't even used to think of, and that is how it affects the, uh, the total carbon budget for the earth. You know, fires contribute, depending on which study you look at, approximately 5 to 10 percent of the global carbon emissions. If we increase the fire activity globally, then that contribution is going to increase. This is Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex, and we're talking with Brian Brettschneider from the International Arctic Research Center. I'm glad you brought up the amount of carbon released because climate critics used to say carbon from wildfires doesn't count because the trees will regrow and recapture the same amount of CO2. But I wonder if the scale of new wildfires, not just in the north, but we've got South America and Africa, whether that will speed up global warming. What do you think, Brian? Well, you're correct in noting that, you know, if, if we assume that the size of forests uh, or, or the, the coverage of forests globally remains constant, that the, the contribution of carbon to the atmosphere, you know, becomes is functionally a constant. You know, so if, if 20% of the earth, and I don't know this number, I'm just I'm using it as an example, Twenty percent of the Earth is, is forested, and it you know it burns at a regular rate historically. Then then you could kind of assume that that's not a changing part of the system, but that coverage of forest doesn't stay constant over time. And so as we are burning more forest, particularly as we're changing the forest cover into something else, into pasture land or other agricultural purposes or or urban urban purposes is we're decreasing the total amount of forest cover globally, and that has an impact because once we burn a uh, forest now and that forest doesn't come back, now we've removed that future sequestration of carbon from the atmosphere. Also, as we burn a lot right now, you know, it, it contributes locally to the, to the global warming that's, that's occurring as we speak. And so even if you say, well, it's going to, you know, in, in, a, in 100 years, you know, that tree, that forest will grow back and it'll sequester that carbon. That may be true, but now what's going to happen between now and the next 100 years? You know, we're in this positive feedback cycle where we're, we have something close to, run, to runaway uh, global warming. Hopefully we're not there yet. But we don't have the luxury of saying, well, it'll be okay in 100 years because these trees will grow back. We need to worry about what's going to happen between now and those next 100 years. Some scientists are concerned that the Amazon may burn enough that it will switch over towards being a savanna or a grasslands instead of a tropical forest. Are there any expectations that if we have more and more serious fires in the boreal forest that it will, say, become open peat bog or something different than what it was? You know, that's, that's a good question. And there's not a lot of concern about um, the boreal forest transforming ecologically into, a, into another kind of ecoregion. But that said, you know, as, say, our black spruce forests, as they warm up and as the permafrost melts and they dry out, it's going to be more suitable for, for white spruce to move in. Areas that are kind of white spruce forests, as they warm up, they're going to be more suited to deciduous forests. And as, the, as uh, the Arctic areas warm up that are currently just tundra, 
they're going to actually have more, more trees move in there where there's currently no trees. And so there, there are going to be some, some land cover changes. But I think the biggest concern here in the, in the, in the high latitudes is what's going to happen with the, the permafrost and the tundra. You know, as we melt permafrost, that adds tremendous amounts of carbon to the atmosphere, carbon that's been locked in the soil locally for decades, uh, centuries perhaps, you know, can all be released in a relatively short amount of time. And then also the tundra fires. And we haven't had tundra fires here in Alaska in 2019. We have in other years, but Siberia has had some tundra fires this year. And those are particularly bad when it comes to releasing carbon in the atmosphere. Because again, the, the tundra isn't able to fully decompose. Vegetation can't decompose fully during the, the short summer. And so uh, freeze-up occurs and, and it gets locked in there. And the next year, new grasses grow and they don't have time to fully decompose. And it just accumulates over long periods of time. And when that burns, it, burn, it releases many, many uh, years of stored carbon all at once. So that's a concern that we have moving forward is that we're going to have more of these fires in the tundra as thunderstorms become more common up there. Tell us about your trip to the Spencer Glacier and what that tells us about climate change. Well, I had the, 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 the privilege of traveling uh, to uh, some glaciers uh, around Anchorage in the recent, uh, this summer, you know, to, to demonstrate and to, and to kind of get a handle on what kind of melting is occurring at the glaciers here locally and, and how that uh, is going to affect the sea level rise and, and what it means for the ecology of the region and, and how it's emblematic of what's transforming in the north right now. And in, in this part of Alaska and, and adjacent British Columbia, we have uh, many, many glaciers and it's a result of tremendous precipitation that falls, you know, several thousand feet up, thousand or so meters in elevation in marginal temperature environments. So we have very, very large precipitation values that fall just below freezing. And so we end up with these very impressive glaciers, but they are always right on the edge of, of kind of catastrophe because when you warm temperatures up just a little bit, you all of a sudden change a lot of that snow into rain. And that has a the dual effect of, one, it's not accumulating new snow higher up to feed the glaciers, but also that rain actually you know, melts snow and ice that's, that's either on the glacier or part of the glacier. And so it, it really facilitates tremendous uh, melting of the glaciers. And that's what we're seeing uh, here in this part of the state is our glaciers are in very rapid retreat. They are they're quickly, um, they're thinning at all elevations of the glacier, so from the top all the way to the bottom. And our trips over to, these, to some of these glaciers this summer just really show dramatic changes over small time periods. You, know, you, you come back year after year, and, and the glaciers look visibly different, even without taking any formal measurements. It's really dramatic, and it, it helps to show people what these changes look like over short time periods, because you know, we, we can sometimes kind of get lost in, in thinking of, of these things in longer time scales. You know, we worry about, oh, well, what, what will Greenland look like in 100 or 500 years? Or you know, what, what will sea level be like in 100 years? But when you can see these changes occurring on an annual basis. It really drives home you know, the sense of urgency about you know, what, what needs to be done to, to turn the ship around. Is the ice around Alaska getting darkened by smoke from the wildfires, therefore changing its ability to absorb heat? You know, whenever there is a wildfire, you know, that, that soot, that black carbon gets released into the atmosphere. The glaciers in Alaska are typically far in the southern part of the state where, there, where there's normally uh, fewer uh, forest fires. And so that's not as much of a concern in Alaska as it is in, say, Greenland, where they're uh, collecting soot from, from not only from forest fires, but also from industrial activities, most notably from Asia. But you know, we, we have uh, volcanoes in this part of the state, and the volcanoes tend to the ash, not only from, from active eruptions, but the ash from historic eruptions that gets blown around on, on dry, windy days, that's probably more of a, of a factor than the soot from the forest fires on, on balance. I know people in the Canadian North who think global warming would be a good idea, at least for them. Maybe winters wouldn't be so harsh and summers a little closer to tropical. 
What do you think, Brian? Will warming up be good for people living in Alaska? You know, I, I actually hear that argument from time to time. You know, there used to be, you'd see bumper stickers on cars and it would say, you know, Alaskans for global warming. And if, if you look at all the, you know, the, the, the positives and the negatives of a warming world, the negatives far outweigh the positives. But on the positive side of the ledger, you know, people would be more comfortable and people would have less expensive uh, heating bills. But on balance, you know, everything else is, is bad. You know, everything, you know, I tell people, you know, I, everything that, that I love about Alaska and everything that, that defines the characteristic of this place in all places, because the climate defines, you know, the look and the feel of a place. And everything is built for the climate. The way we build houses and, and all infrastructure is, is a function of what the climate of an area is like. And as the climate changes, this place will become different. It'll become more like you know, Washington State or, or Idaho, which are great places, but they're not Alaska. And those places will become different. They'll become you know, more like uh, Nevada or, or Utah. And so as the climate warms, our sense of place becomes affected because the nature of locations will, be, will just be different. That said, you know, humans can adapt. We can adapt. We can build new homes and we can change our infrastructure but the environment around us may not be able to adapt fast enough. You know, tree species may not be able to uh, adapt to the climate, and uh, the plants and the animals may not be able to adapt. And so while we may be more comfortable, the environment around us may uh, have a uh, kind of a catastrophic uh, downward spiral along the way. Well, if it burns down and the trees fall over because the permafrost is melting and the uh... The fish that so many in Alaska depend on going out to fish, if they disappear, uh, it doesn't sound really very good in the long run to have global warming, even there. No. And so you, while you may uh, have a, uh, a more pleasant summer to, to outdoor recreate in, the activities that, uh, that, that people like to do for their recreation, like fishing or you know, kayaking, you know, th those, those kind of things, those activities may not be uh, left for us to do if the fish don't return or if the uh, characteristics of our rivers and our forests change. You know, everything about the, uh, the place would be different and, and it wouldn't be nearly as enjoyable. Is there anything else you'd like to add as we wrap up here, Brian? You know, one of the things that people like to, to ask me, they say, is this the new normal? Is this, is this our future? And it's a complicated question uh, and, and it can be unsatisfying when we talk about probabilities. But, you know, this, this kind of summer is, is unprecedented. And we may say, well, this was a one in a, the, the odds of this happening in any given year might be one in 100 or, or one in 500. And in the future, you know, we may not have a summer this warm again for another 20 or 30 or 50 years. But the likelihood of, is much greater now, whereas it was, a, it was basically impossible to have a summer this warm before you know, the last few decades. And now it is possible. Not only that, it's going to be more likely moving forward. So we need to look at these things in relevant time scales because, again, next summer may be much cooler. But the likelihood, the probability of, uh, of these kind of extreme summers is much greater moving forward than it's ever been. From the University of Alaska Fairbanks, we've been speaking with Dr. Brian Brettschneider. And you can find links to his work. And you can find his popular Twitter feed. It's at Climatologist49. And I'll put more links in my show blog at ecoshock.org. Brian, I hope you will breathe easier for the rest of the year. Yes. You know, we, we finally got a little bit of wind and a little bit of rain in the last few days. Not very much, but it's uh, at least blown the smoke uh, out to sea. So, so we are breathing easier for the time being. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. That's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening to Radio EcoShock. Check out my blog at ecoshock.org and please tune in again next week. Music